All right, before we begin, I just want to formally introduce you to the St. Charbel Spiritual Life Center. On behalf of um, Bishop Gregory Monsoor, myself, Subdeacon Vincent, Father Samir, our pastor from Our Lady of Victory, and all of the benefactors and everybody that made this possible, we want to welcome you here today. This is our first St. Charbel retreat. And so um, it's a very, very special day. Today is also the feast day of St. Rafka, and we'll talk a little bit about her and we'll do a, a little prayer as we open. So my name is Ann Boric. I'm a medical physician. I practice internal medicine in Arizona as a hospitalist. I know we have a bunch of people that are medical people. Just show of hands, how many of you traveled from out of state to get here today? Wow, that's awesome. So from, where are you guys from? New Jersey. New Jersey. Where else? New York. New York. I'm from New York. New York. Ohio. Ohio. Buffalo. Buffalo. How awesome. From Lebanon. <laughs> That's awesome. From Arizona. Yep. Yeah? Okay. Beautiful. Welcome. The mission here is really to not only learn about the devotion of St. Charbel, but to emulate him. You know, last night, those of you that were at our Mass, Core Bishop um, Kale talked about how we want to imitate St. Charbel. And that's what it's really about. It's the devotion to the Eucharist, to our Blessed Mother, through the intercession of St. Charbel. And so today, we're going to be talking all about St. Charbel, but in the background of that, it, actually at the forefront of that, is really growing in devotion to Jesus and our Blessed Mother. That's, that's who St. Charbel is. So to, to really respect St. Charbel and his spirituality, that's our goal today, is to ask God through St. Charbel so that we can grow deeper in love with Jesus and the Eucharist and our Blessed Mother. Okay, so this first talk I wanna share with you is really about St. Charbel. I'm gonna go through just a little bit about his background. I wanna talk about three miracles Today, I'll show you some of the medical evidence of it and some of the things that I've been involved with personally. Um, at the end, if anybody here has any personal testimonies, anything, we always want to leave time for that because I think that's very, very important to kind of hear what, what it is that you have to share through the touch of this great saint, this miracle worker. It just tells you how powerful and how this is the time for St. Charbel. More and more people are getting to know him. Before we start talking about St. Charbel, today is the feast day of St. Rafka. And I want to show you um, a picture. This is a, these are three Maronite saints. St. Charbel, St. Rafka, and St. Namtalla. And so oftentimes you see the icon with all three. So today is the feast of St. Rafka. She died on March 23rd um, in 1914. And just briefly, she entered the Maronite Lebanese order. She began praying, asking God to allow her to suffer, to enter into the passion of Christ. Shortly after that, she really suffered in her life. She became blind. She developed what sounds like to me um, bony tuberculosis. Can you imagine how painful that would be? Um, she had a great devotion to the shoulder wound of Christ. And if any of you are familiar with the shoulder wound of Christ, it's, it's the sixth wound of our Lord. And so St. Rufka had a great devotion to the shoulder wound. She was canonized by Pope John Paul in 2001, and she's a patron of lost parents and the sick. We can go on about her life, but I don't want to do that. That's not the purpose today. I just wanted to give her um, just a, you know, a little bit of attention today, asking St. Rufka to pray for us, to ask for her intercession for this day as well. I'm going to show you a short video that I took when I was in Lebanon when we visited her monastery. So you can take a look at it and we'll pray the prayer at the end, which is a beautiful prayer. And Rafa, she's here. Oh, that's So lovely. they arrive, this band of eight sisters, to the monastery of St. Joseph. They uh -huh. dedicate to St. Joseph to start at Ajrabta. We are at Ajrabta. They start the monastery of St. Joseph. And they ask her, why you bring Rafa with you? She's uh, uh, infirm. She, she doesn't do anything. She, she said, I need a holy woman who pray for us for the success of the monastery. Wow. We should build this monastery on her prayers. So Rafa came. She was uh, 
how do you say? Sick, sick and without uh, view, blind. blind. She wow. cannot uh, see. But she came here and she helped the monastic. So this is the prayer. Let us just together pray this. We ask you, St. Rafka, to spread real joy in our world, which is suffering, to comfort sad people and make them happy and caring, to teach us to pray with faith in Jesus and to live peacefully. Amen. Okay. So who is St. Charbel? He was born in 1828, died in 1898. He was 70 years old. As a little boy, his name was Joseph. And at, when he was three years old, his father died, and he was raised in a devout Maronite family by his mom and his uncle. And at a very young age, little Joseph began hearing the call from our Lord to a monastic way of being. In fact, we know when you visit there, there's a little cave in the village where he grew up that he would go in as a little boy and he would pray. He brought a little statue of our Blessed Mother, I'll show you the picture of that cave. It's a beautiful area um, where he grew up. As he got a little bit older, he heard the call to enter the monastery. And so at the age of 23, uh, through the influence of his uncles, um, he entered the monastery, became a monk, he became a priest, and then ultimately he became a hermit. Now, the priesthood is so very central to St. Charbel's life. He was a man of the church. So his feast day is the day that he became a priest, July 24th. As a young man in the monastery, they knew that there was something different about St. Charbel. In fact, we know that when people got sick, for example, his superior, he, had, you know, he, he was very devout. He had the uh, virtue of obedience to everybody, not only the superiors, but he was obedient to even the junior monks at the time. He, there's a story where one of the superior's family members was sick. And who did they call on to pray at the bedside but Father Charbel? And so he went, he prayed. Lo and behold, his aunt or his mother, whoever that was, was healed. And they asked Father Charbel, what did you do? And, you know, with his eyes down and a humble posture, which is how he always was, he said, I prayed. In other words, we have access to what St. Charbel had access to, and that is prayer. Devotion to the Holy Eucharist, devotion to our Blessed Mother. That's who he was. He spent his time in a room no bigger than, you know, six foot by six foot um, in a cell, basically. He worked, he prayed, and he spent most of his time in front of the Holy Eucharist. So if you recall last night, those of you that were here, Core Bishop talked about how he wanted to enter and become a hermit. But that doesn't happen overnight. You, you know, for a long time, he aspired to, to go higher up, deeper in spirituality. But for whatever reason, he wasn't granted that permission until one day, the miracle of the lamp. How many of you have heard of the miracle of the lamp? Okay. That's the miracle that we're told was the turning point that opened his superior's eyes to say, yes, in fact, this is God's will for you to enter into the hermitage. Just briefly, what happened was the junior monks at the time knew how holy and, and um, saintly this man was. So on occasion, they would play a joke on him. You, you know what I mean? They, they wanted to, they kind of made fun of him a little bit in, in jest. So one day, the superior asked Father Charbel to review some files. And he knew that he was going to have to be up a little bit later, so he needed more oil put into his lamp. So he asked the junior monk to fill his lamp with oil. They did, but they played a joke on him. They filled it with water. And they were watching because they knew that, you know, that they were going to eventually have to go back and fill it. Well, what ended up happening was he lit it and it lit. And so they were just amazed, and they knew that water was in there. So they went, got the superior, came back. The superior went in, got it, tasted it, and in fact, it was water. That 
that moment, that time, that miraculous you know, event is what caused the superior to finally realize, yes, there's something very, very different. This is a supernatural, this is God's message and it's a sign that then shortly after that he entered into the, the hermitage. Christmas Eve, 1898, is a very special day because that's the day that St. Charbel died. Now let me tell you just a little bit about what happened. Eight days prior to that, it would have been December 16th, 1898, Father Charbel was celebrating daily Mass, as he does all the time. And by the way, we're told that it was at 11 a.m. at the monastery. Our Mass here is at 11 a.m. every day. So there was kind of that, that reasoning that we, that we chose that. During the celebration of the Mass, after, now understand that Father Charbel would sleep just a couple hours a night. He would spend hours in preparation for Mass, for the Divine Liturgy, in front of the Holy Eucharist, just to prepare because he knew whose presence he was going to be in. He was going to be in the presence of the flesh and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he wanted to spend time to prepare for that. And then after Mass, he would spend hours and hours afterwards just giving thanks to God for allowing him to partake in that mystery. So on December 16th, during the elevation of the Holy Eucharist, during the, the sacrifice of the Mass, Father Charbel collapsed. Now we're told that he had a stroke. I don't think that's what happened, and, and it's not me saying that. When you talk to some of the monks in Anaya, what they believe happened was he was so, he came face to face with the living God. And when that happens, even the Bible tells us you, we can't sustain life because it's, it's too overwhelming for us. So he collapsed, but they took him to a cell, and for eight days he continued praying the Father of Truth prayer. That was the first prayer that we prayed today. It's part of the chaplet. It comes from the 5th century. It's a beautiful prayer. It's part of the, the old, the original divine liturgy. And so that was what he was praying. Father of truth, behold your son, a sacrifice pleasing to you. That's what we're doing at Mass, right? We're offering the sacrifice of the son to the father. That prayer is a very, very powerful prayer. So when we pray it, when you take your chaplet home and you pray the chaplet, just be reminded that that's the prayer that Father Charbel had on his lips for eight days continually and continue to pray it. And so if we think about him coming face to face with the living God, and those words were being said, there's something powerful in those words. So anyway, on Christmas Eve, finally Father Charbel, you know, entered into heaven. How do we know that? Well, that night when they brought his body into the, the Hermitage Chapel, and I'm gonna show you a little video of all of the footage and, and you'll see exactly where that was. We're told that a bright light began shining from the tabernacle onto St. Charbel's face. There was one hermit in, the, in the, the chapel. And so we have that testimony. Now, now, this wasn't too long ago. This was, you know, 1898. You know, Marianne, where's Mary? You know, Marianne's mom is 102 years old. So, I mean, she was alive not long after he died. So we're not talking centuries and centuries ago. This is something that we have written documents today and probably not too long ago, there was a, a hermit that knew St. Charbel. You, you know what I mean? We're in that time. So the bright light shone. Immediately they knew that there was something very different. He was buried in a very humble way, the way that they bury their hermits, in a wooden box on the hillside. Within days, a bright light began emanating from the tomb. And the people from the surrounding villages started seeing this light and they started coming, wondering what was happening. And so they knew that Father Sharba was there, they knew that he was a holy man, and miracles began happening. People started coming. The infirm started coming at the grave site and people were be, being cured. So this got the attention of you know, the authorities and the, so they exhumed his body within 45 days. And lo and behold, when they exhumed his body, his body was as warm and supple, perspiring, and it never stopped perspiring for, you know, 80 plus years. 
to make a long story short, they ended up having to move his body into three different places in the, in the monastery because it, the, the amount of fluid that would come up, in fact, one, at one place, it was behind the wall of the monastery and the, the fluid just kept coming down and under, you know, under the, the stone. So they ended up putting him up into the, into the wall and they secured it and, you know, it's just amazing. What did they do with all that fluid? So, the, it, it, that's right, it was the secretions. What ended up happening, and this comes directly from a story from, remember I told you about Aunt Sadie? At that time, they couldn't keep up with changing his clothing. So they ended up having to call his family, an uncle that was there that had to, you know, change his clothing because it was just, you know, overwhelming. What I have here is a relic. It's a relic that was given to my grandmother, and it's a piece of the cloth of St. Charbel that has the blood stain on it. And if you look closely, I think a couple of you looked at it, you can see that it's stained with, with blood. This was a family heirloom that was given to the Mahlou family. And so that's what happened. And they started cutting little pieces and, you know, the nuns would, you know, sew it into a little casing and they would give it to family and people and healings and babies. And, you know, it was just amazing. My first experience with St. Charbel was probably when I was in grade school. And I'll never forget my grandfather, and you, for those of you that know me, our family is here. My grandfather had severe migraine headaches. I mean, to the point for 20 years, where he would bang his head up against the wall, the headache was so bad. You know, that kind of, and I would remember him putting a handkerchief around his head just to tighten it. Well, one day at our house, my grandmother had a very, very deep devotion. Well, my grandfather took it from the coffee table or wherever my grandmother had this and put it on his head and started yelling to God through St. Charbel to take his pain away. He never had a migraine headache after that. So as a, as a young person, I, I mean, I witnessed that and I saw that and that really made a, a mark, you know, and I thought, St. Charbel was like part of our family, really. So if, if you want to take some time and you can look at this a little bit later. But so his body was incorrupt. He was canonized in 1977 by Pope Paul VI. This is the picture that I took um, when we went to visit St. Charbel when, when he was a little boy in Pacafra. This is the cave. As a little boy, his friends would make fun of him. I mean, he was just such a holy, beautiful um, Beautiful boy. In fact, there was a story that I'll share with you real quick. This was the hillside, you know, and so they had, you know, the sheep and the, the animals. Well, one day his friends were playing, and Father Charbel, or little Joseph, actually, would kind of seclude himself away. Well, there was a, um, a dog that was running, and it was, you know, chasing the kids, and they got afraid, so they ran to Joseph and said, you know, protect us, protect us. And I don't know if it was a dog or if it was a wolf or it was, you know, some animal. Well, he got up and he went out and, he, and the dog was coming and he looked at him and he said, you don't belong here. The tail went down, the dog turned around and, and left. <laughs> and, the, and the kids were like, <laughs> so that was another beautiful story. You should never hear of a quote by St. Charbel. We don't have any quotes by St. Charbel. We don't even have a picture of St. Charbel. So th what I'm telling you, you know, are stories that have been handed down so if somebody says, you know, this is a quote from St. Charbel, it's impossible. He was a monk. He was a hermit. Nobody ever recorded him. We don't have any written documents from St. Charbel, no diary. We do know that one of his favorite books, aside from the, the Holy Scripture, was The Imitation of Christ by Thomas A. Kempis. And so if you look at our website here, um, one of the first virtual videos that I have on there is an audio recording of the different chapters of The Imitation of Christ, so I invite you to, to check that out. Now, I said that there's no picture of St. Charbel. This is a miraculous photo. And you know, the holy oil is a beautiful sacramental, but I gotta tell you, there's nothing magical about the holy oil. It's a relic, and there's a lot of healings and miracles that happen, but just as much as gazing on the image, God's power, through St. Charbel's intercession, can be just as powerful. What happened 
is one day, and in the video, you'll see the actual photo. And I'll tell you exactly, it was 1950. It was May 8th, 1950. And the reason I know it was May 8th, because that's St. Charles' birthday. And when I read that, I said, May 8th was St. Charles' birthday, 1950. There was a group of five seminarians from America that went to visit Anaya. They took a picture in front of the hermitage on the hillside. When they got the picture developed, there was a sixth image monk that appeared in the picture. That's how we have this image, okay? So it's a miraculous, beautiful picture. Let me see, this, is, this was Aunt Sadie's. This is the prayer for beatification of the servant of God, Charbel. So this was one of them, um, which is the prayer to obtain graces, which is part of the chaplet. It's another powerful prayer, but this is an original picture. And this is the image that they used because when you see the original photo, that's kind of what it, what it looked like. And then they took the icon and that's what we see today as the image of St. Charbel. Okay. So let me show you this video. This is a video that I did. It starts out in Bacafara, which is where he grew up in his home. Then we move to the monastery and then we move up to the hermitage. So take a look at this, this video. This is the original home of St. Charbel in the village called Bacafara, where he grew up as a little boy. Entering the house, this is one of the original rooms where he grew up. This is the Valley of the Saints, also known as the Holy Valley. In this valley, we find the monastic heritage of Lebanon. In the monastery of Marlisha, we find the typical setting of a cave, a chapel, the stairs. The rock wall that gives you the feeling that you've left this world and entered into the tomb of Jesus. The cave setting is a reminder that we are pilgrims and that our eyes are fixed constantly on heaven. The Monastery of St. Charbel in Anaya, Lebanon. His body currently is in this place. Many, many miracles continue to occur here. This is a very sacred space in front of his tomb. This is the outside wall of the monastery. Entering inside, we see the chapel where daily mass is celebrated. So a picture of the monks outside lined up against the wall of the monastery. When they developed it, a sixth monk appeared. It was St. Charbel. And it's the picture that everyone uses for his portrait, for his icon. This is the area where St. Charbel toiled and worked in the field. He lived out the rest of his life in this hermitage. This is where he was laid to rest in this chapel. The cell of St. Charbel. We see that he slept on the floor using a tree trunk as a pillow. We cannot say that St. Shabbat is just for the Maronite Church or just for the Catholic Church. St. Shabbat is the saint today for all the world, for all the religions. Because he is near God, he can put us near God. The original packet from Anaya. Now, what we're told happens is they take a basin and they put pure olive oil in it. But in the basin is the relic of St. Charbel, his bone. His relic is there, they put the oil and it's saturated with his bone. That's what the oil that comes from there is. This isn't from like his, his sweat, but it, it touches his bone. So this oil that you got actually is this mixed with 
you know, olive oil. So it's, you know, this would be the concentrated version from there. What you have is this mixed, you know, kind of diluted a little bit, but it's still the oil. And when I talk about the blind woman that was healed, the blessing that she got is the holy oil that you have, okay? Um, but there's a, it's just a beautiful, and then there's the incense from the monastery. So that's where the holy oil comes from. Early on, this would have been the body fluid that was touched to it. And what Father has here is, is St. Charbel's actual bone, which is a first-class relic, and some of his blood, okay? Um, but what you have is a relic because it's been touched to the oil that was saturated with his... Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so that's a good question. Early on, when you saw that, uh, the beatification picture, let me just go back, okay? It was spelled with an S. So the original way to spell St. Charbel is with an S. To the best of my understanding and researching it, the C became, in Lebanon, the French language, French is, is very big. And I think the CH is the French influence. So when you go to his monastery today, you'll see it's spelled with a CH but the original is an SH. Both are correct, okay? We chose to name this place with an S per the direction of His Excellency Bishop Gregory uh, Mansour, because this is the original, okay? Yes. What was his language? Was it Syria? He was, oh, he was Lebanese. Yes, he was Lebanese. Although the Maronite liturgy is prayed in the, in the Aramaic. Yes, Father. Okay, uh, Father Sherbel usually uh, was speak his, his, his daily language was the Lebanese language, but the when he will celebrate mass, the liturgy, the liturgy was in Syriac and Aramaic, which is Jesus' language, and which is a lot of you don't know that that the liturgy at that time during Saint Charbel was pure Roman Latin mass. The traditional Latin Mass. The traditional Latin Mass. And even the vestment that St. Charbel will wear to celebrate the, the liturgy was pure Roman Latin uh, vestment. And he, usually he will speak, he, you know, he should know Latin, Arabic, Aramaic, Syria. All right, let's move on. So St. Charbel had a devotion to the Holy Eucharist and to the Blessed Mother. This afternoon, we have a guest speaker, Father Daniel Maria Klimek, which I think is gonna be a huge treat for all of us. I can't wait. I think it's good. he's gonna be talking about our Blessed Mother. But I just wanna just take a little moment and talk about our Blessed Mother in the terms of how St. Charbel knew her. There's a Greek word called gekeretomene. And if you look at the scripture, Luke 1, chapter 28, when the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, Quiere que quiere tomene. That, that's, the that's the interpretation in the scripture, in the Greek original. And what that means is, quiere is, means hail. Que quiere tomene is a title. If you look closely in the scripture, the word Mary is not in there. The, the angel Gabriel never used the word Mary. We say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But in the scripture, it's Hail, full of grace. Now, what does this word mean? It's more than full of grace. It's a word that has never been used in Greek literature before, other than for the Blessed Mother. And when the angel came to Mary, Mary was not elevated because the angel came to her. The angel knew who he was approaching. And he said, you who have always been filled with grace and continue to be filled with grace. That's what gekeretomene means. Now, when, when we are asked by our Christian brothers and sisters, you know, why Mary? You know, what's so special about Mary? So you point them to Luke chapter 1, verse 28, and the word kekeretomene, which means you who've always been filled with grace from the moment of your conception, 
is actually our doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. So they say, well, where is the Immaculate Conception in the Bible? Well, here it is. It's right here. No one else in human history has ever been called by this title. And so Mary is the Immaculate Conception. She's the one endowed with God's grace from the moment of her conception in her mother's womb, St. Anne. St. Charbel had a devotion to our Blessed Mother because he knew who she was. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? Okay, let's move on. Now we're going to get into some really fun stuff, the miraculous healings. I want to talk about three of them. Remember we said there's over 33,000. Probably some of you have experienced um, St. Charbel's healing power. Um, it's not uncommon. Okay, so the first one is Nuhad al-Shami, who had a, a stroke. Let's talk about that. The significance of this is the 22nd of every month, we celebrate this miracle. That's why we have the 22nd. So just briefly, this is a 55-year-old lady. This was 30 years ago. She had a massive, massive stroke. Bilateral carotid blockage, 99 plus percent on both sides, completely paralyzed, not amendable to medical therapy. You know, if they would have gone in, at that time, the risk would have been too high. I mean, there's just, there's no way anybody would have touched her. She lived in a village not far from Anaya in Lebanon. She sent her son to Anaya to get the holy oil, to pray for her healing. He brought the oil back, and um, she went to sleep, and a vision occurred. St. Charbel appeared to her. Now, there were two monks that appeared to her next to her bed, operated on her. When she woke up, she had two scars on her neck. Now, that sounds like, but I tell you, if you go there today, yesterday, the 22nd, she's there on the 22nd, um, she's there in the, the incision bleeds on the 22nd of every month. Now, um, she woke with a, with a scar. There was a piece of string, unknown, the physical you know, properties were not of this world, and we're told that it was probably a piece of the hair from St. Charbel's beard that he made the incision and um, did surgery. She woke up, and that's what happened. So she decided she was healed, she was touched, she wanted to spend the rest of her life in prayer. A couple days later, he appeared to her in Ged and said, you know, on the 22nd of every month, come to the monastery, propagate the faith, and celebrate the Divine Liturgy, the Eucharist. And so, this is, he said, I asked you to visit the Hermitage on the 22nd of every month, attend Mass regularly for the rest of your life. Since 1993, on the 22nd of every month, they, thousands and thousands of people come to this little village in Lebanon. In... 2018, when I took my mom, when we went to Lebanon, we made sure that we were there over the 22nd. But literally thousands and th tens of thousands of people from all over the world. Pilgrimage to Anaya, to St. Charbel's monastery, and the hermitage is about a mile and a half up the hill. And they, they, they have a Eucharistic procession um, at night, and then they morning, they bring it back down. Many, many healings, many, many miracles occur there today. Here, this one. So this is the incision. This is, this is Nohad with Pope John Paul. So this isn't something that, you know, is, is a story or a hearsay. Um, you know, Pope John Paul II had a great devotion to St. Charbel and wanted to meet her because it's such a beautiful, beautiful story. Now I want to tell you about Arizona. 2016, that's when I had a little bit of a personal experience. So the 50-year the, the anniversary of the beatification of St. Charbel, the relics came to America, and they made their way all across the United States. January 2016, the relics were in Arizona. Um, Father Wassam that weekend had a huge weekend for St. Charbel. He had a mass like every hour on the hour of all the different, you know, uh, rites in the Catholic faith. This girl, Daphne, 
who has no, no clue about who St. Charbel was, came in, she was completely blind. She came because her sister-in-law had heard about a little boy in Mexico that was healed through the intercession of St. Charbel. In Mexico, St. Charbel is a very popular, beautiful saint. So they brought her. She walked in with a white cane. She went to confession. She, at the, at the urging of her sister-in-law, um, received the Eucharist and was blessed with the holy oil on her eyes by the priest. She left. Now, when, when you hear the story, and she'll tell the story, she said that she felt like somebody's arm was standing right next to her on the, on the left side. And afterwards, she, you know, she asked her sister-in-law, like, who was standing? And they're like, there was nobody there. You know, there was like, they were just, the priest was there and that was it. So immediately she started feeling something. She went home that night, four o'clock in the morning, severe pain in her eyes. Now, let me tell you, her diagnosis was called pseudotumor cerebri, or what's called intracranial hypertension. It's a condition where the pressure in the brain is very, very high to the point where the optic nerve is completely irreversibly damaged. So she went through many medical techniques where they tried to siphon off the CSF fluid to decrease the pressure. Nothing worked. So this was like the last ditch effort. She was going to be put in a nursing home because she had three little kids. Um, so that night, 4 o'clock in the morning, severe pain. To make a long story short, her husband smelt something that smelt like burnt meat is what she talked about, and you know, that, they couldn't explain that. She went to her ophthalmologist. This was the 18th of January. Um, was able to see like shadows, but still couldn't see, but they did a complete mapping of the optic disc. 48 hours later, they brought her back. They did another complete mapping, completely 20-20 vision. Now, what's important about that is you know, let's fast forward. Now, you know, she calls the priest and says, I think a miracle happened. He contacts me. We need to investigate it. We put a whole medical team together, um, and there's absolutely no evidence. I mean, I took her to three medical specialists, neuro-ophthalmologists, but what we have is that image from before and after that is, I mean, there's nothing reported in the literature. It's just, it, it's absolutely amazing. Let me let you hear her testimony. Hello, my name's Daphne. I was blind from my right eye. I lost my vision from my left eye. And the doctor at the hospital told me that, that there was no way that I was going to get my vision back. I went to St. Joseph Maronite Catholic Church to visit the relics of St. Charbel. We get there for the healing mass, you know, to, to touch the relics. But when we, when we got there to the, to the church, it was one of those times where, where you're just like tired and you say, please God, help me. You know, I'm tired. I'm gonna give in to you. Please hear me out. If you don't wanna do it for me, do it for my kids. It was four o'clock in the morning. I felt my eyes burning. Did a thorough exam. Interestingly, her vision didn't come back on that first exam. Within 48 hours, when she went to a second <coughs> ophthalmologist, her exam was completely, completely normal. They, they did the test and I couldn't see clearly. My 48 hour, I had 20-20 vision. We as a medical uh, committee in reviewing this case cannot explain this medically. Like the doctors said, there is no explanation. <laughs> God healed me. <laughs> Powerful. So Father Bassam is from Lebanon, and because of Nohad el Shami on the 22nd, he decided on the 18th of every month we would have a healing mass. And so in Arizona, we have on the 18th a healing mass and literally droves and droves of people, a lot of people from Mexico, people come and, uh, and share in, in that Mass. My goal here is to have a, um, a healing Mass for the Spanish community. And the date that I want to choose for here would be the 18th of the month. 
probably not every month we need to get a priest that would that would be able to do it for us but um, so we'll have the 22nd and then maybe every other uh, 18th so that'll be beautiful it's not stopping that's why this is the time for St. Charles and when this came up came about I said that there's going to be something very special um, about this place not seeking miracles necessarily but going deeper in the spirituality to grow deeper in St. Charbel's um, love. In fact, that's what the goal for, for the bishop is for this place. You know, he doesn't want, you know, people just coming to seek miracles, but to really grow in St. Charbel's spirituality. So that's, that's our goal. Let me tell you about the third miracle. Now, this is a personal story. Um, and I, I thought about sharing it, and then I talked to people, and they said, no, you should share it. So baby Lena. Um, a good, this is from Pittsburgh, so people here, you know the mom of this baby. Okay. So we went to Lebanon in 2018, came back and brought a whole stash of the holy oil. I heard that a friend of mine's daughter had a baby, and her baby was born with a paralyzed vocal cord. And it was devastating. And, and I got to tell you, how I was really kind of um, taken aback by it for some reason. I think God had put on my heart the need to pray for this baby, okay? So I, well, I did, and I would often say to my mom, you know, how's the baby doing, and you know, not good, and the baby can't swallow, and so forth. So that following weekend or two, um, we were coming back to Pittsburgh to do the retreat here at Our Lady of Victory. So um, we did a workshop day about St. Charbel, and I thought, I'm going to bring the holy oil, and I want to go visit the baby and maybe bless. Now, we don't necessarily get in the habit of blessing people, right? Because well, I'm not, you know, ordained or whatever. But so, but I thought, you know what? I want to at least bring the oil and bless the baby. So, um, so that's what I did. I came, went to the went to the hospital Friday night that evening. Took a Q-tip. And um, walked in, I, I remember the mom was holding the baby and she said, you want, I said, no, you know, all I want to do is just say a little prayer, see how you guys are doing. And, uh, and that's what I did. And I was really nervous. I mean, I don't even remember what I did. I just maybe started praying the Lord's Prayer and, and I had the oil and I just made a cross on the baby's forehead and she, she choked like three times. And, you know, I'm like, what? you know, so her mom was like, no, it's okay. So then I left right after that. And um, so then the next day, this is what uh, Jenna texted me. I want to thank you again for stopping by last night, bringing the holy oil. It meant so much to have you pray over Lena. We feel comfort. Beautiful. Okay. Two days later, the baby's going home. Now, so that was Friday. Saturday, they did, they did a swallow eval, and the baby passed it. They took the NG tube out. And Lena is going home today. Truly believe in my heart. It's because of the prayers and the holy oil of St. Charbel. Ever since that day, um, we put oil on her head. Progressing words can never be able to express our thanks. Okay? So then, a few days later, Lena is doing really great. She's still eating, hopefully gaining weight. Again, um, I'm sorry. I had asked her. In my response back, I said, do you remember the baby choked three times? Because that was really a prominent thing. And she replied and said, I do remember having three Strider coughs. It's amazing, such a miracle. That was the last time the baby coughed, was when the oil was being put on her forehead. So, I, so, I mean, in my heart, I'm thinking, wow, this is, you know, this is really, really something. So then, this is the picture... <laughs> of the baby, you know, a couple years later, she's eating ice cream. And she's doing, she's doing great. She's part of our community here. And, um, but it's the prayer. It's, not, it's the faith that, that really helps to, to do that. And so that's the third healing miracle that, that I wanted to share with you today. Okay? Um, out of that, what I did was, it was so profound that I put a book together with all the texts and all the pictures and the whole story of what happened for the baby so that she knew, so that she knows when she grows up that, uh, that in fact, this is a story of a miracle, that this baby was in fact cured through the intercession of St. Charbel. The St. Charbel chaplet, in, there's five charisms, if you will, poverty, chastity, obedience, love of the Eucharist, and love of the Blessed Mother. That's who St. Charbel was. So if we begin a devotion 
from today on to St. Charbel, what does that look like? It looks like a devotion to the Holy Eucharist and a devotion to our Blessed Mother, okay? He doesn't want attention put on him, right? I mean, he's a, he's a monk, he's a hermit. Um, but through his intercession, through his prayers, you know, when he heals, what did he say to the superior? What did you do? I prayed. So it's through the power of God that, you know, that manifests through him and through his prayers, okay? I want to invite you to, um, it's called the St. Charbel Prayer Net, Global Prayer Net. And it's a free downloadable app. We started this prayer group that spans across the globe. And on the 22nd of every month, there's an assignment where you get assigned to somebody to pray for that person. And then that person prays for somebody else. And it's like a link. And now we have probably close to 600 people But more than that, we go live and we pray the chaplet, we pray the rosary. And so it's not uncommon, I mean, you guys are part of it, to go live and have people in Uganda, in Malaysia, um, in Canada, in, I mean, all across the globe where we're praying together, minimum 20, 30 people at a time. It's a beautiful little kind of ministry that we have. So I invite you all to to be part of it if you're interested. Um, So that's the, that's the mighty, the mighty network app. Okay. Any other questions or comments that, that you might have about St. Charbo or anything that we talked about? No, I, you mean for me personally? You said that changed you. Yeah, I mean, it changed my way of practicing medicine. That's how it changed me. I mean, I, you know, I've always kind of, I mean, I would always be in church. I, you know, I've always been, um, loved to be in, this, in the atmosphere of the church, of the Eucharist, of... But how that miracle changed me is as a medical doc, for whatever reason, those of you that are medical, you know, we can be at daily mass and then we put on our white coat stethoscope and then you become a different person, right? Because we're not allowed, we need to be politically correct and all that stuff, right? This happened, that barrier dropped, and I got to tell you how powerful it is to pray at the bedside of patients. How... um, I mean, it's, it's transformed the way that I practice medicine as a hospitalist. And as a result of that, I think my patients are being, you know, really touched by, by that. I've never invited somebody to a prayer and have them refuse it, whether they're Catholic or not. You know, so that's, a, that's how it really kind of changed me. The parable, remember when Jesus was in the house and it was just packed and there were four people that carried the paralytic on the stretcher, what did they do? They went, the roo- they went up through the roof and they brought him and put him right in front of Jesus. You know, and what did Jesus say? He, the paralytic was healed. He said, it's your faith that saved him. So we have the power to pray for each other. It's intercessory prayer. What's a recurrent theme that, that keeps coming up and up and up is that nobody is introduced to St. Charbel that he doesn't want to get to know. It's amazing when I tell you that, I mean, that really is the case. So if you're here today, there's a reason that you're here today. If you've traveled, um, I mean, you're not here to see me, you know. There's a reason that St. Charbel wants you to be here, that he wants to manifest his power of Jesus in your life. There's absolutely no doubt about it.